Hi, I'm Cheryl Jackson. I'm joined by Canadian physician and best-selling author Gabor Maté. He specializes in a wide range of topics from attachment to addiction to attention deficit disorder, all of which he connects with parental stress. Hi, Gabor. Um, so you talk a lot about parental stress, stressed parenting. What do, exactly do you mean by that? Stress is um, a demand on the organism that is beyond the capacity of the organism to, to deal with. And uh, it has elements of uh, uncertainty, lack of information, and loss of control, and loss of connection. The, the more isolated you are, the more stressed you are. Now, in our society, because of a breakdown of uh, community structures, clan, family, extended family, people are more isolated. And the demands are also greater. Both parents are having to work now mm -hmm. to provide living for the family. Um, parents are distracted by uh, anxiety about economic conditions. Um, they have less support. Uh, because uh, relationships are more difficult, marriages are very stressed, there's a fairly high divorce rate. And a lot of marriages, even without divorce, are under strain. And all this makes for a lot of emotional stress on the part of the parents, which gets translated to the kids. Not because the parents are not doing their best, not because the parents are not dedicated or devoted, but because they're stressed. Well, how does that stress then affect the relationship they have with their kids? Well, I mean, one statistic I can give you, or one fact I can give you, is that studies, have, a whole number of studies have shown that parents who are stressed, their children are more likely to have asthma. Really? Really. In other words, the child's lung function is actually affected by the emotional stress on the parent. And it's physiologically very straightforward. But in other words, the child is very plugged into the parent, hmm. emotionally and even biologically. And whatever stresses the parent will stress the child. Well, how do parents know if they've got a healthy attachment with their child? What are the signs? Well, it depends very much on the age of the child. Okay. Well, let's say we're talking about a two-year-old. A two-year-old, if the two-year-old is upset, then they'll come to the parent for mm -hmm. soothing. And they'll soothe by the parent very, very quickly. If a child stays away from you or shies away from your contact, or if you can't soothe them uh, and they remain upset, usually that means that there's a, there's a problem with the attachment relationship. Okay, let's move, jump ahead a few years. What if you've got uh, an 11 or 12-year-old? If an 11-year-old would rather hang out with their friends rather than with you, if an 11-year-old is constantly on the internet or on the cell phone, uh, if the internet, if the eleven year old um, is reluctant to um, come with you or, or to have meals with you, if the eleven year old is very resistant, you've got an attachment problem. And what do parents do in that case then? At that well, age? Well, that's the typical question of what yeah. do we do, but right. it's not a question of what we do. Okay. It's a question of let's look at the relationship. Right, so, but so, something so has to be done, no? Well, First thing is we have to look at the relationship and what happened here. Mm -hmm. Why is this child so disconnected? What's going on in my life as a parent that has um, not maintained that attachment uh, relationship with the child? Right. So, so in, other, in other words, we have to look first before we do anything. Sure, I understand. But then at that point, can you create that attachment or recreate it if it's been lost? Well, the good news is that children's need at any age, whether they are 2 years old or 18 years old or 19 years old, is still to have a, a healthy attachment with the parents. And that's a need of theirs. So we can use that need of theirs to, um, to have the confidence that we can rebuild the relationship, but it's our job to rebuild it. You don't make the kid work for it, we work for it. All right, all right. Now you created some controversy when you suggested that parental stress may contribute to ADHD and to autism. Well, Where it did it's not may, it does. You know, like, like, like the research is not even controversial. Okay. It, it's, it's only that. Well, what is the research? Where, where does the idea come from? The human brain development happens in relationship to the environment. In other words, which circuits in the child's brain develop and which don't properly depends on the psychological social environment. Mm -hmm. Big study, big report in the journal Pediatrics uh, in February this year from the Harvard Center for Child Development that a lot of childhood disorders actually begin as coping mechanisms on the part of the child. Now you asked about ADHD. Yeah. Tuning out is not a disease. Tuning out is a God-given uh, or nature-given coping mechanism when stress is too much. Now, since the human brain develops an interaction with the environment, if the environment is stressed, how does a small child cope with it? Well, one way to cope with it is to tune out. But this happens when the brain is developing. So the tuning out becomes programmed to the brain. It's got nothing to do with a genetic disease. 
And the only reason it's controversial is because physicians are not taught about brain development. They're not taught about attachment. And uh, so they don't understand these links. But the science is not controversial. It's very straightforward. But there is science that so shows that some of this is genetic. No, there isn't. There's pseudoscience that shows that it's genetic. Um, there may be genetic predispositions, and I don't deny that. But a predisposition is not the same as a predetermination. In other words, um, if you look at something like um, addiction, yeah, there are some genes that predispose people to addiction. But the studies also show that if those kids with those same genes are brought up in nurturing families, those genes are turned off. So there's actually a science called epigenetics, which is, uh, studies how genes are turned on and off by the environment. And so the emphasis on genetics is a rather boring and unnecessary one, in my view, because even if something is 80% genetic mm -hmm. and 20% environmental, which part can we work with? The environmental part. Now, the fact is most conditions are not 80%, they're not even 15% genetic. So that, and I, I, you know, this, in a short interview, I can't possibly go into the science of it, but I'm telling you, the, the, the so-called science behind genetics is very suspect and is based on very false assumptions, and it ignores the role of the environment in shaping the child's brain development. All right, you've said that you and your two, two of your children yeah. have ADD, right? Yeah. ADHD. Yeah. Uh, how do you know that? They've been, all been diagnosed by psychiatrists. And was it stress? Was it stress? Yeah, that caused it. In my case, I was a Jewish infant under a Nazi occupation in Budapest, Hungary. Mm. Do you think my mother was stressed? Yeah. And, uh, and, and my children were born to a workaholic doctor in Vancouver, British Columbia, who emotionally was not around for his family. That was me. Right. I was still acting out the dynamics that were imprinted in me when I was an infant. So, my, I, so I had a wife who was not emotionally supported, and she was stressed. So, yes, the ADHD was passed on, but it wasn't passed on genetically. So I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not blaming parents. I'm not blaming myself. I'm just saying this is what happens. And if you look at the numbers of kids that are being diagnosed now with all kinds of conditions, ADHD, autism, Asperger's, Tourette's, oppositionality, conduct disorders, a whole range, you know, bipolar illness, anxiety, depression, this burgeoning of these diagnoses, it can't possibly be genetic. Because genes don't change in a population over 10, 15, 20 years. So if 43% more Canadians are being prescribed, or if in Canada, the number of prescriptions for stimulant medications for ADHD has gone up 43% in the last five years, we're not looking at a genetic effect. Genes don't change over five years, over 15 years, even 500 years. Something's going on in society. And what's going on is that the stress quotient is increasing on parents. Okay, what role does our awareness of these disorders have, though? Do you think we're just, I mean, you hear that, right? We're just more aware, so we diagnose. Yeah, that, that, you can make that argument, and there's mm -hmm. probably some truth to that, but it can't possibly by itself account for it all. And, and anybody, for example, who's been in education for a long time will tell you that they're seeing many more troubled kids in the schools now than they did three or four decades ago. Okay, you talk a lot about the importance of parents in a child's life as well, uh, over peers. Why is that important? Well, as my brilliant psychologist friend Gordon Neufeld points out, uh, again, the child's primary need is to attach. Because without attachment, without a relationship with somebody, the child doesn't survive. So our brains are wired to attach. In a culture where the adults are around, where there's a clan, tribe, community, grandparents, extended family, uncles, aunts, the child connects to many nurturing adults. It's a very secure environment. So the studies show that the optimal environment for parenting is actually the hunter-gatherer tribe. The study out of Notre Dame University last year that showed that. Now, in our society, with the breakdown of all those structures, and with both parents being away from the child most of the time, mm -hmm. the child's brain is still driven to connect to who though? Whoever's around, and who's around is the peer group. So our kids now connect to peers. So now you have, for the first time in history, you have kids more influenced by immature creatures than by mature creatures. What's going to be the result? Immaturity, all kinds of behavior problems, difficulties, and developmental disaster. Well, if our society is set up that way, yeah. what can parents do about that? Well, first of all, we have to be aware of it. So that, like for example, here in Ontario, there's the universal daycare program. Full day kindergarten. Full day kindergarten, okay. When in kindergarten, kids spend most of their time with other kids. 
At the end of the day, when you see your kids again, you have to reattach with them. Don't just assume that they're still connected with you. You have to really work at it. So if that's the way we have to live, and I'm not questioning that parents are economically driven to do that, then at the end of the day, let's make sure that we reestablish the attachment, we have spent family time, the family meal should be sacred. On the weekends, no sleepovers, no play dates, but, but time with family, time with adults. And there's many other, and, and of course in the kindergartens, the, the kindergarten um, staff should not just be physical caregivers, they need to be emotional caregivers as well, so the child stays connected to adults. And, and we don't do this very well, so that children naturally become peer attached, and then we lose them. Because once they become peer attached, they resist adults. All parents have stress in their lives, yeah. right? I mean, none of, that we can't avoid it. And, and yeah. I, I don't know if all of it's necessarily bad, but how do we manage it so it doesn't create sort of big problems in our family? Well, first of all, it depends what you mean by stress. Yeah. Um, there's different kinds of stress, number one. Number two, um, if the stress arises, for example, in a parent's relationship, then for the sake of the kids, those parents really better work on that relationship. In other words, don't just ignore it and don't just think that it'll get better because the children pick up on the parental stress. Mm -hmm. And a recent study, for example, showed that p parents who are stressed are less able to attune to their kids. They don't pick up on their kids' use cues so much, not because they don't love the kid, but because they're too distracted and too um, mm, focused on their own stresses. Um, secondly, if you've got workaholic tendencies and 30% of Canadian adults describe themselves, according to StatScan, as workaholics, you better realize what impact that's going to have on your kids. If there's one thing I could do over again, that would be that part of my life, you know, so that minimize the external stress as much as you can. You can't, as you say, avoid all stress, but the self-created stress, uh, minimize it. And uh, realize how important those early years are. And get together with other parents who also realize the importance of attachment. So that bring up your kids in a culture which values attachment, which values connection, and, and, and does not promote the peer attachment. And um, again, you know, take a stress inventory. If your stress is in your life, fine. But look, every week, look at what stresses did I take on this week that maybe I didn't need to. Some you can't avoid, and that's you're gonna have to deal with. But much you can. So what I'm arguing for is an awareness of it. Mm -hmm. The more aware we are, the more we can uh, prevent it or at least deal with it consciously. Okay, thank you. That's great advice. Thank All you. Right. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. You too. Thank you. My guest has been Dr. Gabor Mate. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.